this uh, talk of, seems to be having as much entropy as a subject, but uh, in fact, I think a good good detached from my Marines. Um, so yeah, so I'll start with talking about just uh, eigenvalues of random graphs and some experimental studies. You will not see any theorems in this talk. Well, I mean, I might mention some, but they'll not be mine, and they're not the, you can read about them elsewhere. But uh, so the first thing we talk about is uh, ra random regular graphs. So as you can see, as you know, as you can guess, for any finite integer n, there is a finite number of graphs with, which are k regular. Therefore, there's an obvious probability distribution on them. Just pick each graph with equal probability. The question is, how do we do this? And this was uh, first figured out, I guess, by uh, Bolobash. Um, I've learned it from the papers of uh, Nick Wormald. But uh, the model is very simple. So the question is, and now I go multimedia to this uh, older technology, which works better. Uh, what do we do? How do we generate a random bipartite graph? Well, what we do is we take all the blue vertices. Suppose each blue vertex has val valence degree 3, and each red vertex has de degree also 3. So on the left side, we write 3 times every, every blue vertex. And here, we write three times every red vertex. And then we permute the right-hand side randomly. And then we connect like this. So here's 1, 1, 1. And here may be 1, 2, and 3, which means that the vertex 1 is connected to 1, 2, and 3. Here, there might be 2, 2, 2. And here we might not be so lucky. And here we might get 4, 4, 4. So it means that the vertex 2 is connected to vertex 4 three times, which is a little questionable. But the idea is, if that happens, we just throw out this attempt and do it again. So we just keep doing this until we succeed in getting a genuine graph. And uh, so you say, well, these are bipartite, bipartite graphs. But then you say, well, actually, a non-bipartite graph can be thought of as bipartite because it has vertices of two colors, the vertices and the edges. Each edge has degree 2. Each vertex has degree whatever it has. And so we do the same thing. On the left side, we have the vertices mul with multiplicity 2. And on the right side, we have the edges with multiplicity uh, K. And we do this, and if we get a genuine simple graph, we're golden, and if not, we just throw, throw out this attempt and do it again. And what you can show is that if you just keep doing this, this succeeds with probability that depends only on the degree of the graph. Those are the good news. So in other words, if you want to produce uh, x graphs, we only do f of k times x attempts to produce them. And each of these, each attempt is actually quite fast. It's essentially linear because we do a permutation. And so it's pretty fast. The only question is, what is about this function f of k? Here's the bad news. This function f of k is actually double exponential. It's something like e to the, if I remember correctly, it's e to the k squared ish. So if you do it in practice, which I did, um, this method works fine, fine, where k equals, k equals 1. One regular graphs are very easy to come by. k equals 2, great. k equals 3, very fast. k equals 4, very fast. k equals 5, uh, maybe not so fast. k equals 6, out of the question. So, is it over four? Well, <laughs> yeah. Now, Van Vu has a 
fairly well-known paper where he, so there was an improvement to this method, which was known for a long time, which is simply, instead of looking at your results, and if it doesn't work, throwing it out, you just do it incrementally, and every time, and, but it, when you get a failure, you restart. That actually turns out to work much better. Uh, this function becomes, I think, polynomial. I don't remember how polynomial, but I think it's like k to the fourth or something. But much better than this. These are the good news. The bad news is I had a conversation about with this uh, with Vu recently, and uh, you don't guarantee. So this method was known for a long time. What Vu proved was that the the distribution you get is asymptotically uniform. Well, what does that mean? I, I, for one, cannot generate graphs with infinitely many vertices. I can only generate finite many vertices. And when does it become really uniform? And the answer is, well, for n bigger than about k to the fourth times a constant, which we don't know. But if, if you think of k as being 5, 5 to the fourth is quite a large number. So in other words, for any practical value of n, it is not clear this method actually is useful if you really want uniform distribution. Now, you might not care. But if you do, then I would think twice about using this method. But uh, on the other hand, if you do, if you don't care, then I think there's a program on the Van Vu's uh, website which you can download and it will do things for you. Anyway, so that's how we generate random regular graphs. And then, What do we do with them? Well, as you had the fiber graph and you could make splits, and you sort of pass, you move around the space of graphs by. Uh, How do you flip? Well, this. Is about the same? Well, I think these kind of models, and I'll talk about this later in a different context, it's very difficult to prove to give provable convergence rates. So again, you don't know how many times you need to flip. Yeah, but you can see what happens in there. Uh, how do you know it's uniform? Is this not a standard model? It is a standard model, but it's a standard model in statistical physics where they don't care about provable results. But us being, uh, mm, if you actually care, I mean, if you didn't care, that's fine. But if you do care, not so much. So OK, so we take Laplacian matrix of, of this graph compute its eigenvalues, and ask what the statistical properties of this set of numbers is. So the simplest question is about the bulk distribution of eigenvalues. And there is a, by now, very old paper of uh, Brendan Mackay, where he computes it explicitly. Um, and so for three regular graphs, the probability density of eigenvalues is whatever it says there. Um, so notice a random graph has a spectral gap. This is for the adjacency matrix. So this, uh, um, so in other words, the smallest eigenvalue is bounded away from, uh, from three. Two square root of two is less than three. This is a very important property. Um, a priori, a graph's, graph's eigenvalues, which if a graph is k regular, its eigenvalues are bounded by k on one side and minus k on the other side. McKay shows that with probability 1, they're bounded by, I guess, 2 square root of k minus 1 on one side and minus 2 square root of k minus 1 on the other side, which for large k is very far from k. For small k, 2 square root of 2 is just barely smaller than 3. You need to know, by the way, the bulk is. Huh? The bulk. So this is a theorem of uh, Nick Friedman. What? Well, it, McKay says that the probability density is zero elsewhere, so. Yeah, yeah. Right, oh, okay, all right. Right, right, sure. But it's the same result, it's just, as you say, harder. All right, so this is not a very difficult result, because, and you can look at the paper, it's actually a very nice paper, and what you do is you observe that the, the sums of case, case powers of eigenvalues correspond to walks on the graph, and you can sort of enumerate those and figure things out. 
And it looks like this for three. Now, it's a very nice function, as you can see. Uh, as, interestingly, notice it's uh, extremely non-convex. Um, however, or non-unimodal, if you like. Wait, when you get this, um, is this one run for very large n, or lots of runs for medium size n? Or? This is not, a, this is what the probability density oh, this is. Oh, the theoretical This is a theoretical probability density. As n goes to infinity. Yeah, but in fact, you can do one run for large n, or many large for small, runs for small n, and you get this. It's, it works very well. What I should notice is that as k becomes larger, this graph be become, looks quite different. And kind of when k is reasonably large, it looks like a semicircle. And so this there, it looks like this is a semicircle, as you can see, between minus 2 square root of k minus 1 and plus 2 square root of k minus 1. And in that respect, it's very similar to Wigner's semicircle law, which describes the bulk behavior of eigenvalues for random orthogonal or unitary matrices. But again, k has to become large. This is whatever you might want to call this figure. It's not a semicircle, um, as far as I can tell. All right. So well, that was easy. What next? Well, for finer properties, we'll actually, instead of looking at fancy spacings, we just look at one number, which is the number of spanning trees in our graph. Now, we were talking about eigenvalues a second ago, and now we're talking about spanning trees. As many of the people in this room know, these are the same things, but I'll explain it later. But in any case, that very same Brennan McKay, in the paper written uh, two years later than the previously mentioned paper, showed that... Uh, for any k regular graph, uh, this is bound by polynomial times this strange quantity, raised to the nth power. So in other words, log of the number of spanning trees looks like n times log of this thing. And if you compute it, what it's equal to, so what he shows is that for any k regular graph on the vertices, it is smaller than some polynomial function times this. And there's a sequence of graphs with size going to infinity, which actually achieve this bound. So it's sharp. Previously known results were stupid and gave much worse bounds. But this is sharp. And this is what you get for this log. Now, there's a theorem of Neely that I blow my nose at. <laughs> Well, so here's, here's a, what you, uh, here's, if we were physicists here, then we wouldn't care about the theorem, we wouldn't care about experimental evidence that supports it, and we'll have it. So, so notice, this is the theoretical upper bound, and now we can compute it for large values of n. So the n is equal to 2,000, 3,000, up to 9,000, which takes a long time, even today. And the numbers we get, interestingly, are all bigger than McKay's bound. So apparently, McKay's bound decays monotonically with n towards its value. So you can see these numbers are decreasing, presumably, to McKay's bound. It's OK. That's interesting, right? Um, so that means, so that, I guess, that substantiates this uh, result of which you spoke, that for a random graph, Random graph achieves the upper bound. Yeah, I, think, I think the proof of McKay says that uh, every graph is hybrid. If there are no short cycles, then mm -hmm. you get uh, the graph right. Yeah. So it's not right. Cycles, right. So we get this. But here's something else. So, so. What? Your sequence is not decreasing the one on, on the slide. The first, first slide on the second one. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's probably a typo, yeah. Um, but it sort of looks like it's decreasing slow, very slowly to the theoretical value. <laughs> if you reorder, after reordering, it's decreasing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like many sequences do, yes. Um, 
Um, yeah, but, but, he, but now suppose we, we do the following. We compute random graphs on, uh, on n vertices. And we look at this log of the number of spanning trees. Why do we look at log? Well, because the actual number is much too big to, for us humans to understand. So we take logs to make them smaller and more manageable. And we look at, we know what the, what the mean is. That number's on the previous uh, slide were the mean. What about the standard deviation? That's the second thing you might want to compute. And this is what you get for n equals 2 to 9,000. Notice the standard deviation is decreasing. This is very mysterious. Oh. Well, it's, it's at least not increasing. <laughs> it looks like, if anything, is decreasing. And notice the previous number was normalized by number of vertices. So that 0 0.83, that's when we get the Look at the log of number of trees and divide by n. So it's number of trees per vertex it goes to this log of the number of trees per vertex. But here, we don't normalize. If we did, then these numbers would go to zero very fast. So this is very mysterious because, um, so again, I talked to the aforementioned uh, VU about random matrices. And there are some statements, I'm not sure to whom, about the logs, log, well, so first of all, the number of trees is the log of the product of the non-zero eigenvalues of the Laplacian matrix. So it's log of the normalized determinant. Um, so in random matrix theory, there are results, which I have never actually seen this result, but I've heard of them, saying that the standard, that the standard deviation of the uh, log dead goes up logarithmically, supposedly. I mean, I haven't actually seen the proof of this. Uh, but here, for graphs, we get something much sharper than that. It doesn't seem to go up at all. Now, of course, log is a very slow growing function. And maybe it really goes up as the fourth root of, of log, and which looks like a constant. But come on. Now, does this, does this follow from uh, Noga's results or no? Well, will the lower bound impl imply something? Right. So now, what this does have to do with this eigenvalue spacing. Because if all eigenvalues were wired in place, then obviously their product wouldn't change at all. Notice that if the eigenvalues were randomly distributed between their maximum and minimum values, then you just have a central limit theorem that says that the variance goes up as uh, whatever, or as linearly. So clearly, this is not happening. So it's consistent with the standard models that um, determine shouldn't, log that shouldn't vary that much, but not quite this as little as observed in practice. So there's something to, def oh, by the way, I should say, so this is the roughly what <coughs> the distribution of spacings looks like. This is Wigner's surmise, which is not the truth, but it's very close to the truth. Uh, actually, before, as I was preparing this talk this morning, I tried to find the actual formula, and I couldn't. If you look at meta, there's some horrible expression with, with constants which are not defined. So, uh, <laughs> right. So this is what the graph of the probability density looks like. Oops. And uh, so that's the end of this part of the talk. Um, and for some reason, a slide that's missing says that, that uh, well, actually, the, there are more pictures. They're just not part of this slideshow. Um, but I'll talk about what they mean in a little bit. So if you actually plot the actual spacings for graphs, you get a graph that looks almost exactly like this. So it's pretty clear that some form of random matrix behavior exists. All the conversations I've had with random matrix people indicate that in this a limited degree case, none of the methods work. So I talked to Vu, and apparently the Tau Vu stuff, hopeless. So if you want the problem to work on, you can work on this. Um, 
again, as I've warned you, there's not theorems here. But now we go on to the next. So could you say again, this Wigner surmise graph is a graph of one? The Wigner surmise is, if you look at random Hermitian matrix with the, or, or orthogonal, doesn't matter, I guess, with Gaussian entries. So this is. Well, the, gr the graph looks different? The order vanishing the origin will be different. But, but gr grossly, they look similar. Tau, 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 the exponent. Okay. The S squared would be S instead of S squared. But anyway, so in this case, it's orthogonal matrices, and it looks like. So the spacings between the eigenvalues, if you look at it as a random variable, its distribution, is density is controlled by this thing. And the important thing about it is not just, well. Uh, oops. Yeah, so notice that the peak is away from the origin. The peak is fairly f far away from the origin, and that's. Uh, you mean by the origin, you mean one? By the origin, I mean zero. <laughs> no, right, no, <laughs> but you, you, sorry. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, uh, okay. No, I'm just, because you, if you're doing, if they were uniformly spaced, it would be one. Because if you normalize the spacing to one, or? Uh, uh, if, they, it was, if, if it was a rigid, it would be exactly one. But the answer, if, if they were random, it would be e to the minus. Oh, okay, I see. So now we go into the second part of the talk, which is not PowerPoint. There will be some pictures, though. Have no fear. Uh, so now we say, well, okay, these are purely abstract combinatorial objects, and they seem to behave like some other abstract objects, which are matrices in some ways, but more so in other ways. But now let's look at geometric objects. So. Our, my personal favorite graphs are planar graphs. So the question is, what do you get for planar graphs? Now the question is, well, how do you make them? Well, if you're a geometer, like myself, here's how you make a random planar graph. You take a piece of the plane, like this piece of a blackboard, and you throw in a bunch of points randomly, uniformly, let's say. And then you associate a triangulation to this thing. Well, how? There's a canonical way of doing it, which is to each, this point set, you associate the Delaunay triangulation. What is that? Well, the, the actual definition is it's the unique triangulation so that for every triple of points, their circumcircle uh, contains no other point. So this is a little mysterious and seems to be hard to understand. But in fact, here's a much better definition. Forget the plane. Think of the sphere. Think of these points as being on the surface of the sphere. And as we all have seen, the stereographic projection maps one to the other. And then take the convex hull of those points. So the triangles in the Delaunay triangulation are just going to be the faces of the convex hull. So it's, it's very natural. Mm, the sphere is embedded in three space. Yes, the round sphere in three space. You throw a bunch of points on the sphere, or in some subset of the sphere if you like. Take the convex hull. The combinatorial structure of the will be the Delaunay triangulation. So that's a very nice geometric way of producing random triangulation. There's a problem with this. First of all, again, there's a finite number of planar graphs of a given, with a given number of vertices. Does this thing <coughs> produce each one of them with equal probability? <coughs> the answer is no. I mean, it's not that we don't know. We know it doesn't. Because as n becomes large, with probability rapidly approaching 1, a planar graph is not the Delaunay triangulation of any point set. Why is that? Well, it's a theorem. Because there's a characterization of, due to myself, of graphs which are Delaunay triangulations. I can state what it is, but it'll take us too far afield. But the fact of the matter is, that anytime you have a, usually in combinatorics, you have 0, 1 laws. If it's not everything, then it's nothing. So that's clearly not a not a good way to generate random planar graphs in the sense of, in the combinatorial sense, but still, it is a nice invariant of random point sets. So we can 
look at this. Well, well, generically, you only get triangles. Generically, but with probability one. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, if you don't have triangles, you can triangulate non triangular faces, but then that involves choice. I mean, you can do it randomly, I guess. But, but, but in fact, if you generate these points numerically, you never have to do that because they're always in general position. So, this is how you how you generate a random point set and random delnet triangulation. No, of course. Here I said we're picking points uniformly from the square. But who says it has to be a square? We could take a triangle or some other goofy thing. It turns out it doesn't matter. Now, the other, but we still have our quest about how to generate uh, random combinatorial planar triangulations. And the way it's been done in the past is Peter's suggestion. So here's a fact that the set of all planar triangulations of a given size is a connected set where the edge in the graph is the edge flip. You have two triangles like this, and you set them to two triangles like that. Okay? And so if you allow these edge flips, then you can get from anywhere to anywhere else. And furthermore, it is, I'm not sure if it's actually a theorem, but it's universally believed that if you do a random walk, you're doing these random flips, then this is converges to the distribution of triangulations you get converged to uniform in finite time. And so the way you generate a, a random triangulation is, is, is you flip for a while, and then you pick whatever you get. Every triangulation with the n vertices should occur with the same probability. And is there a reason for this belief that the random walk converges to that? Or? Uh, I mean, as, as long as you have to. Well, there's a spectral gap, right? You don't know that. Yeah, that's the question. Uh, how? how? What do you check? Uh, oh, oh but random guy, this is going to be. The point is that the number of planar triangulations on n vertices is about 10 to the n. That's the theorem of Tut. So, so doing the experiment for any n bigger than One. 3 is, uh, is a little hard. Right. So, that's the problem. Um, I mean, the actual number is well, 256 over. Well, so, so in fact, of course, to in, in fact, luckily for, for us, there is a better way to generate random graphs, and that's planar graphs. And this is a, this a number of papers on this by the French school, the INRIA school. There's a, students of uh, Flagellet. There's this guy, Gilles Schaeffer, uh, who has papers on this. And what happens is that you can, there's a correspondence between uh, planar triangulations and certain kinds of trees, and trees of any kind are generally easy to generate. And so they actually have a linear time algorithm for generating samples. So that's really helpful. There's only one problem with their method. If you're doing experiments of the kind I'm describing, what they're doing is perfect, it's great. But if you insist that your graph be of, si of a fixed size, you'll wait a long time. Because their algorithm generates a graph of about the right size. So if you want to graph between a size of 990 and 1010, no problem, very fast. If you want 1000, you have to wait a long time. Well, uh, well, 20 is a long, you know. In fact, I believe the standard uh, way to say this is a factor of 20 is the difference between your walking speed and the speed of a car. So. It's, it's, there's some difference there. Um, so, okay. So let's see what, 
happens, um, no second. So first of all, uh, there's a picture on the board, which is luckily, well, it was just the first that happened to be there. Um, and what is this? This is the, uh, the histogram of eigenvalue spacings for random planar graph, not Delaunay triangulations, but these planar graphs in, notice that it does not look like Rigner surmise. It looks much more like a Poisson distribution. So, okay, that's interesting. Um, now, uh, this, no, this is eigenvalues for random planar triangulations, which are not geometric, spacings, spacings. Um, you say, well, okay, that's very nice. What about, what about uh, the Delaunay things? And I have to find the, um, hold on a second. Uh, hold on a second. I actually had it on my board, but it seems to have disappeared. Uh, hold on a second. Um, unfortunately, yes. Oh, here it is. Okay. In fact, it's already here. So, okay. So here is the histogram of spacings for the for the Delaunay process. Notice it looks very similar to the Wigner graph. So interesting. Geometric graphs have this property. Uh, other graphs do not. Now this picture here is actually the bulk distribution. Again, the empirical bulk distribution for when you take random points in the square. There's nothing universal about bulk distributions, though, is there? Uh, you're wrong. What? You're wrong. There are many universal things. So, <laughs> so what is wrong? First of all, you, you see, if you look at this picture, you'll see this. Wait, wait what does bulk distribution mean? You just look at, look at all the eigenvalues and plot a histogram of where they are. Okay. Uh, So, so he, but uh, well, you'll see. I mean, again, all I have now is pictures, so everything I say could be totally bogus. But hey, so first of all, notice that if we had a Delaunay triangulation with edge lengths, then we're really doing a computing the spectrum of Laplacian is basically computing the spectrum of Laplacian for the Dirichlet problem of of the normal Laplace, of the smooth Laplacian. So we should have, the, at least in the beginning, the same distribution of eigenstates, because finite element methods are known to work, or at least some people make a living by claiming that they work. And here, here notice all the edge lengths are one. We're not be doing anything other than producing the whole thing geometrically by Delaunay. We're not doing anything else. No real numbers are involved, except at the end. And what you see here, if you suspend this belief very slightly, is a straight line. Now, what does straight line mean? Well, that's just Weyl's law. So one could argue that up until here, this graph models the actual Laplace operator on your domain, which I think for this picture was a square. But it doesn't matter if you do a triangle, or actually, even if you do points normally distributed in the plane, you get the same picture. But that's mysterious, because what tells you is that this Delaunay triangulation coarsely, even though the lengths are all screwed up, actually approximates the geometry of, um, of your domain. It seems that here, at this point, which is about less than a third of the way through, right? It's around five that you get here. I mean, these numbers are, don't mean anything, but it's the proportions that do. Um, we start getting combinatorial effects. So this doesn't look like any planar domain I've seen. 
Now, what's also interesting is if you look at um, eigenfunctions or eigenvectors, since it's, we're in finite dimensional space, the first ones, if you look at them, they look really, I mean, I don't have the picture, sadly. Um, they look very much like the eigenfunctions for the normal Laplace operator, so the sine, sine cos type things. As you go out here, they start looking more and more like delta functions, which is, again, notice, as you go to higher energy in, uh, for normal Laplace operator, they just become like cos nx sine mx, so they become about as unlike delta functions as possible. Uh, not here. Now here, what is this? This is again, I think this is for a triangle. Again, this looks kind of Wignerian, but, and this is the bulk distribution for the cube, I think. So you can take random points in the cube. So you don't have to be planar, compute Donnelly triangulations. And here in the beginning again, you have, uh, it looks normal, but it isn't because the beginning is actually Weyl's law in one dimension higher, but then it becomes strangely smooth. But the picture I don't have here is that if you look for the bulk distribution for other domains, it is not surprising that this initial segment is the same for all of them because again, you can interpret this Weyl's law but the trailing segment, like all these jaggy pattern in the histogram, looks the same for all of them also. Like if I showed you a picture like this, you wouldn't know if it were from a square or triangle or, or what, or just some random probability density functions, function, with, and so I'm throwing Poisson uh, point process points into the plane, you wouldn't know. They all look the same. The beginning looks the same for reasons that can be explained, the end looks the same for reasons I have no idea how to explain. And it's not very smooth, but they all look the same. One question one can ask is, how far does this go? Again, the proportion of the graph that looks like Weyl's law is always around one third. And I think the fraction is almost exactly the same always. But how would you determine that? I don't know. I mean, I'm sure the finite element people have bounds given certain constraints in the triangulations, but I'm sure that's all they are, they're bounds, they're not exact. There's clearly a phase transition here, and I'm sure they don't know how to get that. Now, I shouldn't throw any rocks at them because I don't know how to do it either, but I'm just saying. Sorry, by all look the same, do you mean they all have the same bump here? Yes, yes. Can you say anything about the eigenvectors and the other bumps to the right? Mm, like no, I mean, th there's a lot more work to be done. I mean, these are kind of very preliminary Results. Actually, I should say that the, re the, the reason I started working on this is, was the following. I was actually trying to do data smoothing at some point. And the idea was that, um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you two can uh, read better with the glasses. Um, um, <laughs> exactly. Uh, actually not advertising, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so what I was doing is this, you do data smoothing. And the way you do this data smoothing, the way I was doing it is you have your data at certain point set. So first you, tr you try to interpolate by delta triangulating and then linear linearly interpolating on the, on the simplices. But you say, well, that doesn't quite do it because actually the data is noisy. You want to interpolate and denoise. And so what you do is you introduce a weighting factor so that the distance between two adjacent points, you don't want to be too high. So you introduce a weight on the, how far they are apart. So you just look at the distance, actual Euclidean distance between the function values. And you add that as part of your cost function. And if you write it down, it just seems, it's just a sim simple linear second order differential equation that you're really solving. But the, the idea was, to see how much it helped you to do that, you had to know how many, how many high frequency eigenvalues there were. And that's when I started drawing these pictures and then I was very confused and remain confused to this day. So on this, since you're confused now also, now is a good time to stop. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> and by the way, I, I should say there are plenty of more uh, things to do, uh, clearly. I mean, there's an almost an infinite amount of stuff to do, but it's a little frustrating that proving anything seems very difficult. Maybe. Yeah, something that varies. You said that you can take a random yeah, and have some other stuff. You take a random free regular stuff. Yes. Especially for the eigenvalues, especially for the geodes, and then you can have a class, and then you can have a class. 
Uh huh. Right. Yes, you get poisson. poisson behavior. Yes. That it's amazing. And yeah. if I did it with a, what do you call it, delay? Delaunay. Delaunay triangulation, then I'm back like a random bro. Yes. And this is every time you do it. Yes. The set is quite, there is a conjecture, which is not true, but it's philosophy of many physicists like Berry. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I'm saying, the models I've, I've tried is take an arbitrary planar domain, or like I'm saying, it doesn't even have to be a domain. I generate points where the density is, let's say, normal in the plane. Okay, but it's, the answer is universal. So the answer is universal. In that case, what they find is if the classical billiard ball is, is what you expect, and it sort of sounds, it did sound embarrassing, but if you use integrable, uh -huh. then you get the eigenvalues look random, Poisson. Mm -hmm. But presu presumably, I integrability is, is not a stable condition. If you perturb the domain a little bit, it becomes chaotic, right? So you, when you have both, so yes, if I KM, if you start with something that's integrable, and then you perturb the observable domain, has some integrability features, and then the, then the, then the th theory becomes sort of me messy and mixed. Mm -hmm. If you take the two extremes, mm -hmm. Well, by the way, the same thing works if I take a cube. It doesn't have to be planar. Any geometric. So I take a cube and I generate. Right. That's true. No, but, but like I'm saying, you can take points in the cube. There, every graph can be embedded. There's no problem. But then you can then you are violating what everybody else is trying. No, you, you get, no, th then you get uh, this, uh, what you call it, um, GOE type behavior. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. right. So, so the random graph so is GOE equals spacing. That's everybody's problem. Ran, random fiber. But, but it's a random geometric graph. It's not, it's not a random graph. That's the point. Notice that a random graph, for example, has uh, a, a spectral gap. A random Delaunay graph will not have a spectral gap because it's planar. Right. So it's, it's right. bulk will not. So this function, this doesn't look anything like uh, McKay's law. No. That's why I don't trust the bulk. Uh -huh. The bulk is very sensitive. It's not a universal thing. It never was. Wigner, when he introduced it, specifically went to the local spacing because the bulk is supposed to be dependent on the model. Exactly. Right. But, but my, my point is that these Delaunay graphs, they're a, a density zero subset of planar graphs, which are themselves density zero subset of the whole. So, and yet you, you get back to this. It's amazing that you're saying that Del Delaunay graphs were covered in like random graphs. And I'm guessing the reason is what you're saying is that for random domains, you should get uh, uh, GOE statistics for the eigenstates. And these are somehow mimic them. And this uh, Weil's law behavior seems to support that somewhat. But again, we can all agree that this makes sense, but proving it's a different uh, measure, yeah? Uh, what is quite surprising for me is that you get the same uh, thing with the symmetry notation. Because it's like you have a graph that has uh, the random matrix common sense uh, tells that you, you ex uh, expect uh, one uh, distribution in the area where you uh, where the eigenfunction Well, this is actually, this is an experiment that has to be done. I mean, I, d I don't know that there, you can probably, s you might be able to split the distribution. It, it may be, but of course, looking at the whole graph, looks like the, you only have the GOE kind of behavior. So you're sure it's GOE and not uh, interpolation between uh, 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 
I'm not I'm not sure of anything. But but the fact that it looks so much like GOE means somehow that this you know this is kind of less than half of the whole spectrum, and notice most of the density is elsewhere. Uh, the, the what, if, if you look here, you get delta function like eigenvalue. I'm not sure what happens here. Here you probably get a mess, is my guess. But, but here you get delta functions. If you look at really high energy states, then. Is that is that true? I, uh, and wh what's the connection between the eigenfunctions and the uh, eigenvalues in that sense? Well, there's, uh, there's a theory. So you may be right. I mean, it's an experiment to do. So the software is there. I can just do the experiment and see if, if maybe towards the end you get start getting different statistics if you truncate. So yes, that's a very interesting thing to try. Uh, again, I mean, there there are too many things to try in some some sense. But yeah. Did you try random points on us here? Yes. Same. But what what what's not about that? But but again, the point about the point about ge geometric graphs that's never going to happen because they're never going to look like trees. The gro growth is always very low. Yeah. So that's it's quite. In some ways, it's a radically different universe, but in some ways, apparently not.